Hello, and thank you for coming. Um, as, uh, as we were introduced, we are both art directors from uh, Saatchi & Saatchi, which is an advertising agency in, in Copenhagen. So we are not uh, classically trained as designers, but more as uh, conceptual uh, makers. We have a, um, a bachelor degree in graphic communication, which is sort of like graphic design, but um, a little bit different. I can't explain the difference right now. We don't have time, I think. Um, so uh, we would like to uh, just to, to would just like to give you an introduction to uh, to what kind of work that such and such a Copenhagen has done um, uh, the Nordic uh, market and the Danish market is uh, is quite small, which means the budgets are small, which means that it, uh, we get uh, challenged in, in different ways to to come up with creative solution and sometimes we definitely um, I'm not happy that we don't have enough money to sort of like spread the word, but uh, it also forces us to 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 come up with uh, new ways to to do stuff basically. Um, so here's um, uh, three works that we done a couple of years ago. Uh, not not just uh, Silas and I, but also our colleagues at Saatchi, um, which sort of sort of shows uh, how we would like to approach things. If I can make it work. Uh, be patient. It's all worth the wait. Uh, well, so how how are you doing? So, yeah. <clears throat> Here we go once again. Just, just, just to, uh, just to, to back up what Cliff just said. It's, it's funny about the tendencies because sometimes when, like Cliff said, when we, when we work in a very small country like Denmark, you actually have to make up your own tendencies because you don't have money to follow what, what's happening uh, in the other places in the, in the world. So what, what uh, Saatchi Copenhagen was, uh, has been, been really successful with what's making these viral films, uh, uh, which basically is commercials uh, spread through internet, YouTube, or Facebook, uh, so and so. So these are a few examples of that. Um, Wait, I'll, I'll try to make it work. Should I just? Um, we're going to see two uh, two virals for for Sprite Zero, and just to give you some background information, we uh, were told by the client, the Coca Cola company, that Sprite was the uncoke of drinks. So it was uh, more or less everything that Coke wasn't. <laughs> Let's just see it now. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so it was the truth-telling uh, Coke. Uh, yeah, Coke. Sprite was uh, the, the drink that uh, sort of uh, was telling it like it is. And uh, our interpretation of telling it like it is is, uh, is a payoff called um, no sugar, no bullshit. Um, sorry about the swearing, but that's actually uh, what's it called. So um, let's just see. Him So there was a little truth about friendship. I don't know if that's actually true, but made people laugh and it got uh, spread uh, around the net. Um, we're just going to start over again.
So, um, so these were spread virally, and uh, of course, the uh, the uh, the financial or the economic challenge that uh, was that we basically didn't have any money to make these films for, and uh, we tried to keep the budget as low as possible, and of course, like um, save budget and on actual media. Uh, so we seeded them, spread them on the internet, and then they lived on their own and were quite successful within the, the, the Nordic area where, where we meant to spread them. Um, the next uh, uh, viral film actually uh, uh, caught on quite big. Um, it's got, I think, uh, around like 40 or 45 million views now, um, which was, of course, lovely, but not really intended. Um, Quicksilver is a brand in... in uh, Quicksilver is a, is a surfing brand, basically. And if anybody of you have been to Denmark, it's definitely not a surfing country. It's uh, it's really, really cold and miserable. Um, so, so we had to make another reason, uh, tell people another story. Uh, rather than sunshine and big waves, we had to create sort of an idea and identity of what Quicksilver could be could mean to 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 the to the Nordic consumer, basically. And uh, this is what we uh, this is what our colleagues came up with. So um, you might ask yourself, what has this got to do with uh, sustainable design? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it is uh, it is an uh, an approach to 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 making a solution where you don't have any money and uh, uh, where where you seem where it seems like most of the odds are uh, are against you, um, which is also sort of the, uh, the 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 philosophy for for for. For the paper dispenser that, that we got awarded for yesterday, thank you very much. Um, um, where basically we were approached by WWF, and of course there was absolutely minimum budget for this, so we came up with this idea, which actually just uh, well, it required basically that we uh, that we sort of uh, ruined a normal paper dispenser and uh, and 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 changed it uh, to our benefit. Um, we would like to show you on on a communication level what you um, you probably all seen some of some of some of this stuff but but there's a great tradition from from WWF all around the world to actually uh, allow and and buy some some great communication um, and with with this I mean print ads and stuff and not uh, technical solutions but great communication we hope that this uh, slideshow will work. Uh, you might have seen some of these examples, but uh, we're just going to show them anyway. Okay. We're really good with viral, but with shit with computers. So uh... <laughs> now it's time to do it. <laughs> so just some few few examples. Um, uh, a solution from uh, Austria, I think it is. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it says that when you turn on the light, you will harm the uh, the environment, uh, which is sort of like um, shown uh, that the the border in the middle of the picture. I mean, I'm just gonna 
explain this, you, you might already get the... <laughs> it's not that I think you're stupid, but... I'm, um, but uh, you can see the, the wallpaper where the penguin, uh, the penguin just underneath the light has, has disappeared. So uh, basically indirectly showing that turning on the lights will, uh, will harm nature. Okay, one, two, three. Oh my God. All right, that, that, was, uh, that was apparently all the examples that we can show you. Um, but we knew that WWF had a, a long and great tradition of making great print work. Uh, so we also hope that uh, WWF in Copenhagen would sort of see this as an opportunity to do something uh, a bit creative, a bit more um, innovative, uh, than they would expect, basically. So we created the uh, the paper dispenser. Uh, you go to the, should go to the front page. There it is. So uh, we cut a hole in the paper dispenser and put up see-through, see-through uh, plastic glass uh, printed on a uh, silhouette of South America. And then again, put a layer of green foil uh, behind it. Our our aim was not to make this uh, particular dispenser sustainable. Uh, our aim was to sort of ambush the the media, if you could call actually call it a media, and show that you could actually very few, very few modifications actually communicate something that would make people think about the environment and the uh, and their uh, consumerism, basically. The, the, the thing about the thing about the, the paper dispenser was that, that Cliff and I was actually kind of fed up with seeing all these right in your face kind of ads about save the and every, everything is kind of like feel guilty about this and that and feed the people in Africa and don't don't use light or gas or whatever anymore. So we were more like maybe we could we could grasp people at a at a at a moment where you, where you can actually do a difference. Not that you will save the whole world by not using a lot of paper, but it might might change your mindset a little bit and uh, create a thought that you might bring, like carry on with you. Um, so therefore, this was the for us the most simple way of doing that. Um, it's exactly. It was. It wasn't about. It wasn't about saving the whole world with a paper dispenser. But it's maybe rather than using four pieces of paper when you dry your hands, just use two. Uh, it's all those uh, cumulative small things that we can do every day that will actually, at the end, make a change. Um, the strategy behind this was actually um, we tried to to figure out how to get all the players uh, to support this. So. So our thought about this is, of course, that companies would would uh, would profile themselves if they donated X amount of money and got one of these dispensers. So the actual companies where the dispensers were, they would seem to have a, a greener profile and show that they care. And of course, all the the proceeds of of, of the actual dispensers would go to WWF, thus making uh, getting more contributions. Uh, but also we uh, approached the uh, the manufacturers of the dispenser and uh, and uh, showed him a, that he he could actually uh, no showed him a new way of of making money basically rather than just seeing his paper dispenser that he rents out to to companies to see that as a media for uh, uh, for advertising uh, future in the future so we actually made some solutions for the, for the paper dispenser uh, manufacturer where we, he could see that he could actually use this uh, this surface of, of the papers dispenser as a as a media um, to to advertise on. So we tried to to cover all the bases, uh, WWF, uh, the actual donators, um, and the manufacturer of the um, of the paper dispenser. Enough about that. We would, uh, you've probably seen, um, we, we, we would like to show you now what, what happens if, if, if an agency actually gets a brief that uh, has to do something with sustainability, um, uh, what could actually come out of it. You might have seen some of these cases, but basically it's to show that uh, when we're not selling diapers or Coca-Cola, then um, if we get a brief that is about sustainability or social issues, that uh, 
we can actually do some some pretty good work there as well. Um, the first uh, thing we're going to show you is uh, a case that we did at Saatchi and Saatchi. It's not about sustainability, but it's uh, at least a social issue. It's um, it's a uh, it's a project that we did for the Danish Parkinson's uh, Association in Copenhagen, and we've done a little case. So here it comes. Copenhagen, two-bedroom apartment, 39 square metres, close to Amar Centre with great cafes and shopping nearby. Here you get a cosy little flat and a unique opportunity to experience the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. De 70.000 bolde, der er her i lejligheden, illustrerer, hvor svært det kan være at gå rundt, hvis man er ramt af Parkinson, og så derfor har stivhed i kroppen. Det kan være heldet bare at sætte glas på plads, hvis man er Parkinson, og derfor ryster. Lige om et øjeblik kommer og en Alexandra, der er protektor for Parkinson-foreningen. Og hun skal så prøve på egen krop, hvordan det er at leve med sygdom. Det er meget interessant at prøve at vise os, altså, Publikum, hvor svært det er en, en hverdag er. Bare bevæge sig. Det er en lille lejlighed, og det har taget lang tid at komme rundt. I, i Parkinson-foreningen har man jo lavet en lejlighed, ja. som er en slags, øh, hvordan er det at have Parkinson? Okay. Og I den anledning har Dansk Parkinsonsforening spredt 70.000 plastikbold ud på gulvet i en lejlighed på Amager. Yes, uh, well, I, I, we just heard that we run out of time, and that's because uh, uh, our DVD doesn't work, but uh, that doesn't matter. Um, but there are some great projects out there that uh, has been started from an ad agency's point of view, and I know that I just saw a poster here in Madrid for the Earth Hour, turn off the light uh, one hour uh, someday, and that was actually created by a, uh, the whole idea and thought was created by an Australian agency who got that um, assignment from, from UNESCO down there. So it started out in Sydney and spread to the world, basically. So, um, so uh, back to the tendencies in, in, in Denmark. Uh, when you're low on, on, on money, then you've got to be uh, sort of high on, on, on effect and uh, definitely uh, creativity and a good idea and some, some, some wow can, can make up for that. Um, and can actually bring you to and it can actually bring you to to other medias than 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 the the, the basic film radio and print medias so uh, i would we would say that that would be the tendency in denmark for creativity right now it may be sustainable or not i don't know <laughs> thank you very much thank you for your patience good afternoon uh, i'm alexander kraai uh, Creative Director of uh, Spring Creative Communications in the Netherlands. Um, we're 
based in Utrecht, uh, which is a city in the center of the Netherlands, uh, with the largest uh, university in the Netherlands and the largest uh, school of the arts in the Netherlands. So there's a lot of creative uh, companies uh, gathered together in the city. Uh, basically, the, the, um, the smaller companies, because a, a lot of the bigger companies are based in Amsterdam. Um, but there's a lot of creativity and also uh, what uh, uh, they told about uh, low budgets and high creati uh, creativity. I see that the same in, in Utrecht uh, with, with uh, smaller companies. Um, our company works for um, um, commercial clients, uh, educational clients, uh, cultural clients. Um, but on the, uh, apart from that, we also uh, do our own initiatives. Uh, we reserve time and uh, budget to just create our own ideas. And um, I'll tell you about one of them uh, later. Um, I would like to, to show a few of the trends that uh, we see in our company and in the projects that uh, we do. Um, and I'll illustrate them with a few uh, pro uh, projects. First, uh, the first trend I see uh, is sustainability. Um, second one is sharing, and that's in multiple uh, ways. And the third one is fun, and it's a bit uh, broad uh, uh, definition, but I'll explain that later. Um, in the Netherlands, there's um, a whole new movement in sustainability, a movement uh, that doesn't focus so much on telling people what they can't do, but uh, focuses more on uh, improving the design to reduce waste and creating awareness so that people think more before they produce the waste. And maybe because they're thinking about it, they produce less waste. Um, so it's, it's actually a very positive uh, movement. Instead of telling people what they can't do, they, they say, okay, if you do it, be aware of what it, what, what it causes. Um, and improving the design so um, it doesn't produce the waste anymore. One uh, project I'll show you is the project uh, that our company has won the award with yesterday. It's an uh, eco-friendly typeface. Um, our team uh, asked ourselves the question whether it would be possible to design a typeface uh, which um, um, uses less ink. And um, we, we did a lot of designs, we did a lot of testing, uh, we um, made smaller letters, we uh, left out stripes out of the letters, we left out squares, circles, triangles, everything. Um, but the first designs uh, weren't really satisfying in the printing. And our goal was to design a typeface that is ink saving, but at the same time very readable. Um, and in the end, uh, we, we found a, a, a design that is still readable if you print it on 10 to 12 points. Uh, you don't see the holes anymore, but you save about 20% ink. Um, I think this is this is a, a good example of um, improving the design. So we're not saying, okay, you cannot print any more. Of course, it's better to print less, but some things you have to be uh, you have to print. So um, if you print it with less ink, then both the environment uh, uh, and people are uh, uh, gaining from it. Another um, project in the category uh, sustainability is uh, 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 flip-flops that are designed at the TU uh, University in the Netherlands. Um, they're made from old uh, car tires, so it's actually a cradle-to-cradle cr -cradle product. They use the waste and they make a new product from it. And it's, it's in the shops right now and it's uh, very popular. And um, it's not only um, good for the environment, but they are produced in South Africa. So it's also, there's also a social component um, in the, in the slope, uh, slums of uh, South Africa where there's a lot of uh, people without work and they can produce these uh, products right now. Uh, 
then I'll tell you something about the, the sharing trend. Um, it, it's in different ways. Um, you have the whole open source um, movement of uh, sharing your products, which could be music, which could, could be software uh, designs. Um, but it's also sharing experiences with your friends, uh, sharing the things you've, you've made. Um, and one of these projects uh, that we've done for um, uh, the Spanish writer Carlos Ruiz Savon, we created for the Dutch publisher, uh, we created a uh, game where the readers can share their experience and they can uh, test their knowledge about the book. And so the, the, the people can uh, also communicate uh, on the website about uh, the book and what they thought about the book and um, playing the game and and of course this um, actually this this project could also fall under the fun factor because um, it is a way to um, um, commun do communication uh, but through fun so you actually uh, give the the readers of the book something fun but you also want to attract more readers or you want that they buy the next next book, of course. Um, but the open source um, uh, movement uh, causes companies and people uh, to change their way of making money. Uh, for example, musicians uh, which, uh, uh, whose music is copied, they are uh, having to sell merchandise or... Uh, making their concerts more uh, uh, expensive to get the money. The same thing is, um, is, uh, goes for the communication sector. Um, they invest in this game, but of course they, they want to earn the money with the books. So they produce products that don't gain the money for themselves, but they win the money on some other product. That um, Nextly... That also goes for the for the Ecofont. That was an open source typeface, so um, it's free downloadable uh, on the internet at ecofont.com. Um, and it was really funny um, when we uh, uh, put it online. There was um, first it was in the, uh, uh, caught up by the press in the Netherlands, um, and then by the weblogs. It, it went all over the world, from National Geographic magazine to Oprah Winfrey magazine to The Times, and um, it was the campaign was worth uh, a, a lot of money, and we didn't invest that much money in it, but we didn't gain any money with this product because it's an open source product. At the same time, uh, we got a lot of responses from uh, users worldwide, and they they gave us suggestions on how to. Uh, improve the, the the typeface um, because uh, the readabil readability on the screen wasn't so good because the holes and the pixels uh, distort a little bit. And also, bigger companies have their own house style font, so they don't change to the eco font because they have spent a lot of money um, uh, de uh, designing their corporate identity and their house style, so they they won't change into the eco font. So then we um, did a new brainstorm uh, with these suggestions and we came up with software uh, that, that works in Office, Word, Outlook, and you can print eco-friendly in any typeface and you see your original typeface on the screen. So you can read it well on screen and print it in any typeface. And um, I think that's, that's an aspect of globalization that people from Japan, from Australia, from uh, the United States, South America, gave us suggestions and it brought us one step further uh, in the process and made us think again and how we could uh, make the product even better. Um, Then I, I, I told a little bit about fun already uh, at the, the Carlos Ruiz Savon game, uh, but I have two other examples, uh, projects that we uh, did. One of them is a game for uh, a multinational medical company. Um, they wanted to um, communicate with a younger target, target group because all the older managers 
they knew already and they had a really good contact with them. But there was a new generation of people getting responsible for the products that they sell. So they wanted to reach them uh, uh, on uh, an exposition, a uh, medical exposition. And so they asked us to um, try to catch their mission statement in a game. And their mission statement is sharing uh, expertise. So we made a game that uh, you can win if you share the, the most expertise in the right time. And then the next example of um, the fun factor of communicating. Uh, actually, we did this game, uh, did, this was one of our own uh, uh, initiatives. It's also free, uh, so it could also be in the, in the sharing uh, uh, trend. We found that our company, we, we make games as well, and we found that a lot of our clients didn't know so much that we uh, were in the gaming uh, development sector. So we thought the best way to show that we are able to make games was to make a game and show them. Um, at the same time, we were a bit fed up with the, with the credit crisis and all the negative news about it. Um, it was in 2008, in the end of 2008. So we thought it was uh, nice to make a game where uh, it, it's no longer the question how much money you make on the stock exchange, but it's the question how long can you stay on the stock exchange without losing all your money. So this is what the game is about. You get some money and uh, the time you can stay on the stock exchange without losing your money is your high score. Um, and actually it worked really well because uh, after this a lot of our clients asked us to, to make uh, new games for them. So these are the, the three trends I see in, the, in, in my company. So sustainability sharing and uh, the communication through fun uh, and attracting instead of telling. Thank you very much. Noi siamo uno, uno studio de, di architettura, uh, siamo posizionati a Milano e uh, vorrei presentare la mia, il mio lavoro uh, focalizzando su una questione fondamentale che è quella di disegnare un'idea. Noi pensiamo che fare progetto oggi eh, sia essenzialmente quello di cercare e trovare un'idea da disegnare. Eh, una delle caratteristiche principali del nostro studio è quello di lavorare su molte scale diverse, 1, 10, 100, 1000, e progettare proprio a scale diverse. E oggi eh, voglio, voglio farvi capire come disegnare un prodotto industriale, un interior design, eh, un interior, un'architettura, un, un, un negozio, sia fondamentalmente un problema di individuare e disegnare un'idea, attraverso naturalmente l'individuazione di un tema. Quindi vi presenterò alcuni progetti, anche molto velocemente, tutti sono accomunati da un tema. Il primo tema è quello della, del progetto come ricerca sulla tipologia. Eh, può essere un oggetto, un prodotto, uno spazio, un'architettura, ma fondamentalmente eh, cercare e ragionare sull'interpretazione di una nuova tipologia. Uh, ieri sera abbiamo vinto questo premio per uh, Bested per questo progetto. Uh, concettualmente si trattava di risolvere un problema che c'è in tutti i bagni delle case dove lavabo e water sono due pezzi eh, molto diversi tra di loro per dimensione, proporzione, disegno e quando sono molto vicini sono brutti da vedere allora la nostra idea è stata quella di mixare questi due prodotti tra di loro e cercare di farne uno solo che fosse esteticamente, funzionalmente più interessante quindi l'operazione che abbiamo fatto è fondamentalmente questa E questo è il prodotto che abbiamo disegnato. È eh, fondamentalmente un, un sanitario dove c'è un lavabo e un water, eh, dove eh, la questione è che la forma, eh, la tecnica 
la, funzio- la funzione e la sostenibilità sono tutte mixate in un unico pezzo, in un'unica idea. Eh, la cosa interessante è eh, che l'acqua che viene usata per lavare le mani viene raccolta in, una, in un tank, in, una, in un contenitore sotto, viene depurata, pulita, colorata e viene mixata con l'acqua di rete per usarla nel water, con un risparmio di circa il 25% di uso dell'acqua. Quindi in questo senso è eh, abbastanza so- sostenibile. Ecco, questo è il pezzo che eh, io spero che chi lo vorrà comprare lo compri perché è bello non perché è sostenibile o non perché è tecnologicamente avanzato, solo perché è bello. E questo mi sembra una cosa già importante. Eh, Questo è un progetto di di un grosso intervento di architettura interna. Eh, Avevamo uno spazio ex industriale eh, da ristrutturare e trasformare in una casa per una famiglia di quattro persone. Il problema fondamentale era che questo spazio non aveva eh, luce, non aveva esterno, non aveva cielo e non aveva eh, come dire aria. Allora l'idea coraggiosa è stata quella di eh, demolire una parte della copertura, no, demolire una parte della copertura per fare un patio interno e eh, individuare una nuova tipologia di casa che in qualche modo assomiglia alle case romane di una volta che avevano un patio interno dove la casa in qualche modo si avvolgeva e si strutturava intorno a questo patio quindi vedete che c'è una parte di tetto demolita e una parte ricostruita perché l'edificio inizialmente era fatto da due padiglioni Ecco, qui si vede il patio interno con la piscina, è un patio assolutamente costruito di pietra perché non c'è terra, non c'era terra, gli ulivi che ci sono sono invasi proprio perché non c'era terra ma solo pavimento e la cosa interessante è che tutta la casa ruota intorno a questo spazio interno che è assolutamente privato e in questo modo abbiamo ritrovato l'aria, il cielo, eh, la luce eh, che prima non c'era in questo spazio. È un progetto dove... Eh, Un altro tema importante per noi è la spazialità, la ricerca della spazialità e il controllo della dimensione dello spazio, che è fondamentale, oltre naturalmente al disegno di alcuni effetti speciali. Però per noi è importante riuscire a controllare sia quando si disegna un sanitario o un oggetto molto piccolo, sia quando si disegna un grosso edificio, controllare la scala e capire che tipo di progetto stiamo facendo e che tipo, su che tipo di scala e dimensione stiamo lavorando. Sarebbe assurdo disegnare una penna come un edificio o un edificio come una macchina. Questo è il problema del progetto uh, a, a varie scale. Qui si vede la, la, la spazialità di questo spazio, come tutto è stato molto controllato. Ecco, è importante a nostro parere per il nostro lavoro riuscire a controllare bene eh, dal volume generale all'ultima vite, all'ultimo chiodo solo quando serve e in questo senso c'è una sorta di idea di sostenibilità non sprecare le cose ma usarle, controllarle quando servono Eh, lo stesso vale per la decorazione eh, per, eh, per la qualità degli spazi per il controllo degli spazi è interessante anche in case molto minimale creare, oltre al controllo dello spazio, oltre alla funzionalità, eh, dare valore allo spazio e creare delle emozioni. È importante eh, creare, usando i mezzi dell'architettura, dell'interior, del product design, creare delle emozioni per chi poi questi spazi o questi oggetti userà. Questo è un mobile invece abbastanza interessante perché eh, oggi chi di voi si occupa di interior design, di product design, sa che ci sono per, 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 per lo spazio living questi mobili orizzontali lunghissimi, allora c'è bisogno sempre di una casa che ha uno spazio di 8 metri, 10 metri, 20 metri, 30 metri per mettere questi mobili molto, molto belli. Allora noi volevamo fare un mobile di lusso, molto ricco, che però forse avesse una dimensione molto molto ridotta, 3 metri per 2 metri, e mettere all'interno di questo mobile tutto quello che serve per il living, quindi piatti, bicchieri, libri e soprattutto tutti gli elementi tecnologici che ci sono in, come primo oggetto il televisore. 
Allora, oggi il televisore ormai è un televisore al plasma, molto, molto ridotto in dimensioni e il problema è dove lo mettiamo. Se lo mettiamo contro il muro perdiamo lo spazio davanti, se lo mettiamo davanti perdiamo lo spazio dietro. Noi l'abbiamo messo, l'ho interpretato come, una, come se fosse un anta scorrevole. Quindi il televisore scorre e scorrendo libera una libreria che sta dietro. In questo modo c'è una funzione particolare che è quella del movimento. Io posso vedere il televisore tutto a destra, tutto a sinistra. C'è anche un'idea emozionale di vedere un elemento tecnologico che scorre. C'è anche un grosso problema tecnico di gestire i cavi in modo tale che non si taglino. E allora la, il mobile a seconda di come viene posizionato eh, ha anche una veste grafica diversa a seconda, e quindi io posso anche creare in qualche modo il disegno del mio mobile e, e, perché questo si muove e libera i, gli elementi dietro anche i fianchi sono elementi scorrevoli che scorrono e, e possono essere contenitivi Il secondo tema che vi propongo è quello del progetto come rapporto tra ricchezza ed essenzialità, che nel nostro caso viene essenzialmente interpretato eh, con le questioni di eleganza, raffinatezza e controllo di materiali e dettagli. Questo è un tavolo che abbiamo disegnato, un tavolo eh, molto semplice nel suo disegno, che però ha nell'uso di materiali una ricchezza e la capacità di creare situazioni ed effetti molto particolari. All'esterno, si chiama Jad perché è dedicato in qualche modo e riferito a Donald Jad, il famoso scultore, all'esterno è rivestito in acciaio, super mirror, quindi è come se fosse a specchio, all'interno è rivestito con uno specchio colorato e la cosa interessante è che all'interno sembra esserci un buco, sembra bucato allora la cosa che mi è piaciuta di più è quando un bambino si è infilato dentro a guardare cosa c'era eh, giù perché è, è come se fosse un buco e, e quindi su questo disegno molto essenziale molto puro c'è comunque una, un, un effetto molto ricco ecco qui si vede un po' cosa succede cioè, lo specchio rimanda tantissima luce uh, Spesso noi facciamo eh, negozi, boutique in giro per il mondo, per il marchio La Perla e qui eh, questo tema dell'acciaio super mirror e della ricchezza che un materiale può eh, instaurare è interpretato nel disegno di una scala che sembra una scala, essendo questa rivestita nella parte sotto tutta in acciaio sembra una scala girata al contrario, come una scala di Escher e allora la cosa interessante di questo spazio, di questa boutique, che dovrebbe essere una boutique di alto livello, è quella che la decorazione è in qualche modo poco usata, ma gli elementi tipici dell'architettura, che sono il disegno, il materiale, l'effetto del materiale, riesce a portare questo showroom ad un livello piuttosto alto. Questa è una boutique uomo, dove i temi sono gli stessi fondamentalmente. Ecco, questo è un altro tavolo dove il problema è il rapporto tra astrazione e eh, funzionalità, eh, nel senso che se voi vedete un semplice piano con delle gambe sempre in acciaio super mirror, ma le gambe sono posizionate in maniera strana eh, che eh, può essere considerato dal punto di vista del disegno un'astrazione, in realtà sono posizionate esattamente dove non danno fastidio quando uno si siede, in modo tale da non avere la gamba in mezzo ma sempre la gamba o di fianco. E quindi, eh, come dire, questa astrazione diventa funzionalità e viceversa. Eh, ma soprattutto è un tavolo, come eh, penso in tutte le cose, che io vorrei che la gente trovasse fondamentalmente bello e nient'altro. Ecco, la cosa interessante è che la gamba, essendo in, in acciaio super mirror, scompare perché riflette il pavimento e quindi fondamentalmente io vedo solo il piano che è l'elemento principale del tavolo, il tavolo fondamentalmente è un piano e basta, no? non, serve, non dovrebbe servire altro. Ecco vedete qui ci sono quattro gambe ma in realtà è il piano che, eh, che esiste e basta, non c'è altro. Uh, progetto come equilibrio tra semplicità e complessità, una cosa molto difficile gestire la complessità che può essere di diversa natura, tecnica, funzionale o quant'altro, e riuscire a fare un progetto invece molto semplice, 
che è in realtà la cosa eh, più interessante ma anche quella più complessa mm, un'azienda ci ha chiesto di fare una collezione di rubinetti e allora eh, il problema era in questo caso cercare un'idea e trovare un'idea da disegnare nel senso che il disegno non è per noi il progetto non è puro disegno ma è eh, come dicevo prima disegnare un'idea allora ci è venuta in mente la, la famosa legge fisica della mano destra XYZ e in qualche modo abbiamo pensato che queste tre linee potessero diventare le linee d'acqua l'adduzione dell'acqua, l'uscita dell'acqua e la manipolazione dell'acqua e da qui è nata una, una rubinetteria fondamentalmente un, un sistema di rubinetti molto semplici, sono tre tubi in uno arriva l'acqua, in uno esce l'acqua in uno c'è la, la manipolazione della, della miscelazione dell'acqua no? Ma fondamentalmente qui il problema tecnico era molto complesso, ma abbiamo cercato di risolverlo in maniera molto semplice eh, attraverso un'idea. Quindi non è un problema di disegno, ma è un problema di idea. Poi naturalmente ci sono tanti altri pezzi. Questo è un altro interno che vi faccio vedere molto velocemente, è eh, la, la sede di Confindustria, Confindustria è l'associazione degli industriali italiani a Bergamo, eh, si trattava di disegnare gli spazi di rappresentanza, di incontro, di riunione, eh, è uno spazio molto piccolo, la cosa interessante è che non ha finestre, non ha aperture verso l'esterno, è come questo spazio che è completamente chiuso. E allora... Uh, noi abbiamo cercato di, anche qui di ritrovare la luce, lo spazio, l'esterno che mancava attraverso il soffitto, quindi non avendo apertura a parete abbiamo cercato di ragionare sul soffitto e far diventare il soffitto, uh, il, il prospetto, la facciata che questo edificio non ha. E quindi nel soffitto abbiamo disegnato otto lucernari quattro veri e quattro finti che vedrete che caratterizzano e costruiscono questo tipo di spazio. Ecco, vedete come il soffitto che altrimenti era alto tutto tre metri è stato disegnato e aperto e, 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 e lavorato e costituisce in qualche modo il carattere di questo spazio che è disegnato da questi elementi eh, a soffitto e da tutti gli altri pezzi. Un altro problema interessante in questo progetto è eh, il rapporto tra mh, modernità e eh, ricerca avanzata tipica di, degli industriali e di un'associazione industriali e tradizione e serietà invece di un ente molto importante, molto eh, pesante anche. Allora il, il tema è stato quello di interpretare dal punto di vista dell'uso dei materiali il rapporto tra modernità e contemporaneità e tradizione. Infatti c'è legno, eh, pietre, eh, uso di materiali particolari. Invece quando si è trattato di disegnare la sala conferenze eh, l'idea è cambiata completamente e eh, ci è venuto in mente di disegnare uno spazio assolutamente monomaterico, tutto in legno, pavimento, soffitto, pareti, assolutamente in un unico materiale con texture molto diverse perché volevamo che in questo spazio ci fosse un rapporto molto intimo, molto privato e anche molto domestico eh, tra, tra le persone dove anche il, il disegno delle texture è diventato disegno tecnico dei, um, per, per risolvere i problemi acustici, ad esempio, no? per rompere sempre eh, il... Uh, vi faccio vedere come sono quei tempi. Vi, vi faccio vedere l'ultimo progetto che... Um, è, è, è improntato sulla ricerca del valore espressivo di un solo materiale, di un materiale che in questo caso è il vetro. Il vetro che spesso rientra nei nostri lavori, ma che è un materiale che reagisce in modo incredibile con la luce, dando dei riflessi e una ricchezza molto particolare. In realtà il vetro è un materiale in sé molto duro, molto rigido, molto... Uh, semplice dal punto di vista della sua uh, essenzialità iniziale che, lavorato in un certo modo e usato in un certo modo diventa assolutamente molto ricco questa è la sede di una vetreria e allora con loro abbiamo provato a portare al limite massimo l'uso del vetro sia dal punto di vista tecnico che del suo valore espressivo 
Uh, è un progetto di architettura esterna ma che fondamentalmente vi mostro solo nella sua parte interna. Questo è l'esterno che è una sorta di scatola in vetro nero uh, con diversi tagli, uh, molto secco, ma è all'interno che il vetro è giocato come se fosse lo spazio l'esposizione stessa della capacità che questa azienda ha di costruire eh, oggetti e lavorazioni in vetro. Quindi è come dire, la mia casa è l'espressione di quello che io so fare. E il focus è su questa scala, che è una scala completamente in vetro, senza una vite, senza una parte metallica, che è autoportante estetica funzionale solo per l'uso che ne è stato fatto del vetro una scala che ehm, collega due piani e ha solo partiture, partiture in vetro come funziona? funziona perché i vetri e i granini sono infilati in alcune pareti che hanno delle scanellature e quindi sono semplicemente posizionati senza viti, senza niente. Questo naturalmente vuol dire portare al limite la capacità di uso di un materiale, potrebbe essere qualsiasi materiale, ma dal punto di vista dell'immagine dello spazio, della costruzione dello spazio, è un materiale che, 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 che ci ha aiutato molto. La parte sopra che vedete con vetri colorati non è altro che un'esposizione di colori di vetri che questa azienda fa, ma in realtà per noi è una quinta espressiva molto importante dal punto di vista architettonico. Nella sala riunioni abbiamo disegnato un tavolo, sempre in vetro, completamente in vetro, che è come una sorta di diamante, perché l'idea massima, la massima espressione del vetro è in qualche modo quella del diamante, che poi è diventato anche un tavolo per un'azienda che lo produce, quindi si, si, si vende, si vende anche molto in Spagna, mi hanno detto, che è una sorta di due o tre diamanti, eh, sempre in vetro a specchio, che si posizionano sotto un piano in vetro. Uh, mi fermo qui perché credo che il tempo sia finito. Grazie. Uh, first of all I want to introduce myself, I'm Magdalene, coming from Austria, as you already heard, uh, representing Trash Design uh, Manufacturing. Um, first I want to tell or talk a little bit about my daily work, how my uh, yeah, working life is, and then also we were asked to do some observings uh, on tendencies in our working field um, and also future developments. Um, as the name already indicates, trash design, uh, my work is based on trash, waste, basura. <laughs> um, I would say I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a designer, let's put it like that, um, or not like a normal or classical designer. Um, I don't work in a studio or in a fancy office where I design, paint things or develop things. Um, my work is very down to earth and I try to explain why. Uh, first of all, I work for a social project. Um, and the, the project is for long-term unemployed people as well as handicapped people, like physical handicaps. Um, and what we do is they stay with us for about six months. Um, we teach them, we qualify as far as possible, um, and we try to reintegrate them to the so-called first work market. Uh, that's the, that's the, the goal we have. Um, this is one part of my work. So I'm I'm also, and this is also part of my education, I'm a social worker. Um, the other part is what I would rather call craftsmanship, um, based on the material we work with. Um, what you see here is part of my working place. Um, it's about 1,000 uh, tons of waste a year, uh, which is just electric and electronic waste equipment. Uh, we get it from the municipal waste disposal site. So all the waste we need people to throw away or dump, we get it. Uh, and basically we dismantle that uh, the single raw material, so we collect them like aluminum, copper, plastics, whatever, uh, and then give it to other recycling companies, which 
what would be the correct word, they, they, they make aluminium out of it again, for example. Uh, but for me, uh, this is the raw material I'm allowed to use because we get funds from the government, but 20% uh, we have to earn by ourselves. Uh, and that is actually accomplished that we turn these things into creative crafts pieces and sell them. Um, and I want to show you now some of the things we do, a bit more about the materials um, I have available to, to work with. This is what we have really, we have tons of these. We have these hard drive disks. Um, we have tons of mobile phone buttons, but they actually, it's a dying race because they don't produce these mobile phones anymore. The new ones look different. Uh, yeah, cables, every kind of cable, data cable, color phone one, single color, multicolored. Circuit boards, that's my personal favorite. <laughs> um, yeah, and washer drums, actually, because we have every day, I think, they dump at least 30 washing machines. They all come to our place. Uh, and here... Um, here you already see when we start to, to cut the things and break it into smaller pieces, uh, also these parts are from tumble dryer drums. Uh, it's all stainless steel, so I myself think that it's a very beautiful material um, and it's really made actually to, to last forever, so it would be pity just to throw it away. Uh, and here I brought some pictures in the right-hand corner. You always see the so-called raw material. Um, and then there is some pictures of the products we, we manufacture out of it. So here you've got necklaces made of hard drive disks. Um, then these mobile phone buttons, which we turn into necklaces and earrings. Cables, some of them, let's see, yeah, all these data cables, they seem, they don't look pretty because they are gray outside, but if you start to open them, <laughs> then they are quite beautiful. And there's every color range uh, and combination you can, yeah, you can imagine. So we use them a lot for necklaces and rings. Circuit boards we turn into watches, notebooks, for example, as well as, as jewelry. I'm quite glad that there is more than green circuit boards. There is almost every color you can imagine. I did not know that 10 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, here it's the combination of the stainless steel of a washer drum or tumble dryer drum and cables where we make um, like bracelets. We also have the sand, uh, sand blasting equipment so we can, the ornaments you see in the, at this one bracelet is actually sand blasted. Yeah, here's some of the furnitures, like couch table and, and the stool. This is the doors of the washing machine. Uh, we also use this sandblasting technology uh, to, to put the ornaments on it. Yes, trophies, I mentioned that yesterday. Normally it's my job to make them, not to receive them. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> glad about the one we, we, we received yesterday. Um, all made of recycled material. So this is really part of our philosophy. So at least 90% um, needs need to be recycled material. Yeah, and that's also, that's my personal hobby is handbags made of the most weird materials you can imagine, uh, which is mainly uh, sheets of washer drums as well as circuit boards. Just a few more pictures, so we they, they should not, I mean, mainly they are fun and unusual, but there is also things like, for example, the big one that you really uh, can put this uh, A4 sheet like paper in it, so we also, I mean, I, I try to <laughs> consider the practical thing of it as well. Men always say you can also use them as a weapon. <laughs> I never had that idea, <laughs> Yeah, that was just for a project. We were asked for uh, a convention to make, uh, to create like a bag where they can put all the uh, the, the, the folders and inside, uh, which needed to be very 
cheap, let's say, and so we tried to do this of these uh, cartoon folders to make uh, yeah handbags for this convention. Yeah, now we because we 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 make many products for women. That's actually the problem, but we don't have so much for men. So <laughs> we are working on that. So that's the first prototype of briefcase, but it's there's still much work <laughs> to to be which needs to be done. So far to my to to my work, or why I think I'm not a normal designer, so to say, um, because what what it's really a combination of design craftsmanship as well um as as and social worker because actually and in my daily life it's actually the other way around i'm first and foremost social worker craftsman and designer is the last one actually um so far to to my workplace what i tried here that changed a little bit actually uh, is just to to show that the, we all no matter in which design field you're working we all uh, face different challenges what I, what we learned now is that you do uh, for example a management course because it's not part of the design education but we still need it because if you want to sell your work uh, then you need management skills as well um, in my work field there is also I see that there is much more um, needed or many things um, I need to take many things into consideration because part of my design work is uh, for, on one hand we have customers and their wishes especially when we produce the trophies for example on the other hand I call them here trainees that's the people I have in my course yeah uh, and from the point of a social worker actually for me first and foremost it's important to help them yeah so whatever i produce and i have to consider that already in my design when i do um, a new a new product um i need to design it in a way that it's really that i can teach people in a very short time how to do it um and they should actually part of the project is that they that they are uh self-esteem that they feel worthy again that they really feel they are able to do something to produce or manufacture something yeah so they need this feeling of um i'm good for something yeah so my design needs to include um that it's very simple and easy to teach because six months is not a long period of time um what is also important or what is a di uh, an additional challenge is very often i work with people whose first language is not German. So it's very often difficult to communicate, actually. They also don't speak English. Um, so we, it's also, you, it's re, it really needs to be simply explained, as well as the tools we have. I work in a simple mechanical workshop. So we have every um, tool for manual work, but I don't have any fancy, special, technical machine. Yeah. So everything is really depends on pure craftsmanship that's the next next aspect which i have to consider when i design something new because there are so many other things or when i see all the work my colleagues uh, presented then i'm really impressed yeah but that's something yeah we will just never be able to do that <laughs> because we really everything needs to be simple and and still down to earth that's that's how i call it what we also have as well as such in such you mentioned cost consciousness yeah we are not allowed to use um much money it's public money we have to report everything um so if possible work almost without money um this is the things i have to i have to consider in my in my daily work as well as that's what i call available material here um because it depends of if I do a trophy, for example, and I just need 12 trophies. Yeah, it's quite simple. I can do a fancy thing. But for example, like a month ago, we did trophies and I, I had to produce 170 pieces made of recycled material, which really makes it a bit more difficult because that re reduces the material I'm allowed to use because I don't have 170 things like f of every recycled material. And I have to do the same thing next year. So I already have to think in advance, okay, what, what material am I allowed to use? And that's challenging, but very nice. Yeah? But that's, that, that's just about my work now. Um, now I, I try to, to mention some of the um, 
yeah of this of of the developments or observings in this field of recycling, that's actually what I'm talking about. One one part, or when we received the invitation to take part in this round table, we were given this word "local," so global and local. I thought, hmm, what's uh, what's the what's the reference to my work? And then I noticed just one thing coming into my mind is um, the local aspect is. All the waste is discarded in Vienna, that's a fact, and it's uh, dumped by Viennese people or Austrian people. But none of it is produced in Austria. It's produced in any other part of the world. In our, in, in our case, I would say especially China, Taiwan, this, this Asian, this, the, the Asian part of the world. Um, and the influence is whatever is produced there, and however that technology changes, um, that influences the resources of my job. And we had that, for example, with the hard drive disks, because the old generation has a special size. Yeah? I did quite many trophies with it, and not a problem, but the challenge is now the next generation is uh, three centimeters smaller, which, um, and the whole concept doesn't work anymore. So um, I just have to start and, and relaunch certain things, <laughs> just because now, they produce different things in another part of the world, which is definitely influencing my local work. That was the aspect I, or the idea I had when I heard this word local. Um, what I also did is, we should actually more talk about the future tendencies, um, but I had a very quick look um, into the past, past of recycling. Because I think it actually there is a connection from the past to the future, and I found that at least that's what the research or the books say that the first uh, recycling object done in 1917 was a fountain made of a wall hung urinal by a French person. Um, this I've never seen again actually, but the next three pictures I I, I show you they. Definitely, they have to do with the future because I guess you might also be familiar with it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the original because there is this stool made of a um, tractor chair um, and I've seen at least 20 other models because as well as maybe in other design fields but in recycling especially, uh, the material and the ideas, they repeat itself, they recur, they come again and again and again. Um, for example, these two uh, was actually also new for myself. The rover chair is, is taken from a, from a rover car. It's a seat uh, produced by Ron Arad. That's the original. At that time, in 1981, that was really the first one. Meanwhile, you find many copies, and I've seen way more copies of this um, chair, which is called here Consumer's Rest by Frank Schreiner. Um, I, I know at least 10 artists are working with these shopping trolleys and making chairs out of it. Um, and I would say that's definitely, that's, that's part of a, a trend or development, that, um, which is okay because for sure materials recur and come again because it's the same things we have maybe around us. But I think the challenge, but that's also kind of part of the development, is definitely uh, that you come up with... Um, new ideas for it. Um, that's what I... No, actually, sorry, that was... The <laughs> what I wanted to say, I have to say a little bit later. What I did here is um, to, to analyze a little bit uh, what parts there is more aspects in recycling and design for me. Yeah? Um, one is at the left-hand corner or left on, on the top is definitely necessity because I would say the bigger part of the world all the southern hemisphere and I just came from Papua New Guinea uh, they all recycle Africans recycle South Americans recycle but not because it's their philosophy and not because it's cool because they don't have anything else they do it to survive uh, they do it because they have no other option and they are not proud of it Yeah, but um, that's definitely part of the development, yeah? And it's sold here, and we love it. But they have a different approach to it, most of them, or the people I've talked to. Then there is this other field in recycling and design, 
which I would call this environmental part, that we definitely, in our throwaway society, we have the problem that we just don't know what to do with the waste. So we um, have to come up with ideas to reduce it. Yeah, and to reduce it in a creative way is just one part of it. Um, and there you have these two fields. You can, uh, you can reuse it, sorry, that's the correct word, in a big scale, for example, that you use it in architecture. There, is, there were many entries from a um, Dutch um, architecture um, an office yesterday at this exhibition. And what they try is they try to get in Dutch industry um, or connect industry who who discards material really on a big scale um, and get them in touch with architects and designers to use um, really tons of this material. Yeah, so that's that's another way. My field is I would rather say it's it's the one mentioned um, here at the at the bottom right, the the small scale thing because what we do is rather we show. Um, that there is a creative way what to do with waste, but it does not really contribute that that the waste is reduced because we don't we can't use that much uh, recycled material. Um, and that's what I wanted to mention before. This is for me what I listed here uh, is actually these 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 developments. You have two uh, you have two parts of recycling. The one is, uh, to the left, is, is recycling in the way um, you see something. Um, my, my example is always show, show, one, show a person a key of a keyboard and ask him or her, oh, what, what could you make out of it? I think 90% of the people would say that would make a nice ring. Um, this, this is uh, just obvious or self-evident. You see a certain material, um, and 90% of, 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 of the people have the same idea what to do with it, uh, which is nice, I think. Uh, and it's also part of the development that uh, these, these, these handicrafts, that people want to have something self-made at home. Uh, there is a whole, there is many books right now and even websites, they call it these do-it-yourself or ready-made things, yeah, which are really just supposed that you buy it and you just make one or two pieces for yourself. Yeah, which is which is, I would say, a nice um, development in this field, um, and you can really you can really observe that we were talking about that there is really instruction manuals how to do it. So you you just follow the instruction and you have then your own chair whatever. When it comes to the real design or what we often call upcycling, so you you do not just use it in a very obvious way. You you, you use it in a way that you say, okay, it's, re it's, it's reused material, yeah, but I give it a totally new function. I, I really, I do something, nobody else had this idea. I use it in a totally different way. Um, I use high quality production, maybe even like what industrial design does. I have then another example at the next, um, at the next page. Or I um, combine materials which are, uh, and this combination never existed before. I find a new definition of consumer's behavior. And the next tendency, which is really, I think, yeah, the future in the next years, is that designers go back to craftsmanship. If two or three years ago, or a few years ago, that was the absolutely no-no. That if you're a designer, <laughs> that crafts people and designers, it's just two different world, worlds. And now, when, especially when it comes to recycling, that's really, uh, that's, that's new and that's upcoming. That designers um, and, and craftsmanship really go together. So that's at least in, I've spoken to, to a few people in Europe this, that this is a kind of development. Um, and the next the last three ones is just examples for me which which follow this upcycling process. Um, I guess you've seen that before. This is a new use of a material. This is made of polyethylene bottles. Um, that's a person in England, actually. He has a machine to squash them and to make sheets, and the, sheet, the quality of the sheets is extremely strong. Can, you can work with it like with wood, um, but you can also form them. 
Um, and I think that's a good example that you give a recycled material a new, a new use and a new function. Um, as well as here, that, yeah, it's two more, and then I'm finished. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you... Uh, you might have seen that before these these bag might uh, made of these pull i think pull tabs you call it from the from these aluminium uh, tins um but that's definitely craftsmanship and patience and very well done don't know if you've seen the other two chairs uh it's made uh by a guy in israel uh yeah he uses these um huge inner tubes i think it must be truck tires um and constructs the metal co oh, and, and um crafts the metal construction and then he then they are just blown up when they, when they're in there and he makes many different kind of furnitures and that's the last one when it comes to jewelry many people work with work with bicycle tires I've also, I know many Spanish people actually doing that. Um, but here, for example, somebody really um, found a different approach to, this, to the well-known material of bicycle tire, um, which is mainly jewelry, but that's craftsmanship. Uh, and that's really somebody who decided to, uh, to get into, uh, to get into the, the material and use it in a totally different way. That's just three examples. I know that there is many more, and some of them you can also see at the exhibition, actually, um, in the Matatero. Yeah, so far to what I brought along. <laughs> Thank you very much, Magdalena. Uh, it's time for discussion, so if you can, <laughs> where you are. Um, Ahora vamos a abrir un turno de preguntas, de reflexiones. Eh, eh, recordaros e invitaros a la exposición que tiene DIMAT, eh, en el cual están todos los premiados. Y vamos, yo estuve ayer y es una exposición realmente interesante, en el que no solo vais a ver el trabajo de la gente que está aquí, sino de todos los que se han presentado. Y vamos, os... Os digo que, que vayáis, os lo sugiero, no lo digo. Eh, si os parece, para iniciar el diálogo, eh, voy a algunas ideas eh, que he recogido de las distintas ponencias. Eh, de, de Cliff y Silas, eh, yo creo que el dinero no es un freno para la creatividad y el cambio de actitud está en nuestra mano, ¿eh? como como nos lo han dicho su, su pro proyecto. De Alexander, las tendencias que, que nos ha mostrado, con las que estoy totalmente de acuerdo, sostien sostenibilidad, eh, compartir y diversión. Eh, Gabriel, eh, Gabriel nos ha hablado de un concepto que, que cada vez se está viendo más en diseño y en innovación, que es la hibridación a través de combinar dos elementos y de forma muy gráfica lo hemos visto como el lavabo y, y el VC se iban, se iban fusionando y como eh, la búsqueda de posibilidades no tiene límites ¿no? y a través del trabajo que hacen con el cristal pues nos lo han, de, nos lo han demostrado y ese, esa reflexión que surgió ayer también de la relación entre la estética y la ética. Y por parte de Magdalena, eh, eh, el renacer, yo creo que a través de su trabajo se ve que todos los productos tienen una última oportunidad, eh, todo puede renacer y también el compromiso social puede ayudar a que a través del diseño la gente no solo cree... No, lo, no solo le sirva como un arte terapia, sino también como, como un medio de vida, y que eh, la imaginación solo tiene un límite, que es aquel que nosotros decidamos. Entonces, es el turno para vuestras preguntas, para vuestras dudas, para vuestras reflexiones. Ahí hay un micrófono. ¿Alguna pregunta, alguna duda? Bueno... Son un poco tímidos, yo voy a hacer... Ah, hay una por aquí. Tenía una preparada, por si acaso. 
Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, primero que nada, felicitarles por el trabajo y porque pues, se preocupan por estas cosas. O sea, yo doy la enhorabuena tanto a la EOI como a aquellos que organizaron este, este tipo de, de concurso, donde se ve que el diseño puede ir mucho más allá que lo que mucha de la gente piensa y que puede aportar en cuestiones no solamente económicas o de comunicación, sino también para ayudar a compartir con los demás eh, pues lo que el entorno que corresponde o que todos tenemos que compartir pues todos los días. Eh, sí me gustaría saber eh, cuál creen en cada uno de sus países que ha sido el factor que ha detonado o apalancado eh, su situación en el diseño. No sé si me expliqué. Un pelín más. Okay. <risa> eh, en cada uno de sus países, ¿cuál creen que sea el factor mm. que ha permitido que el diseño se desarrolle hasta el punto donde, donde están ustedes ahora? Mm -hmm. uh. Quizá no es solo un factor, claro. <risa> I, I, I don't know if this actually answers your question, um, but there's been a long tradition in Denmark to be a design country. Um, uh, we, you've probably all heard of Scandinavian design as such, um, and that stems from a, 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 it's, it's really rooted in, in what uh, uh, you talked about, about craftsmanship. So there is a long tradition in Denmark that design is... Uh, is available for for young kids as a uh, as a means of 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 making to to make a living basically so we all fed up with uh, no not fed up <laughs> we all brought up with the <laughs> with the danish design and 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 things being designed to be functional and and design uh, being important to to the functionality of a, of a product to make it either good or or easy or uh, maybe sometimes uh, pretty um Uh, but it, it's a it's a it's a tradition, and, and, and in, in Denmark that we it's it's accepted, and it's it's an easy path to to choose. If of course you got the talent, I don't know if it answers your question. Perfect. <laughs> Maybe just to to show or to to speak about the other side of the coin, I would say, but. I really, I can just speak about recycling design. That's the people I know all over Austria. Um, I would say Austria is the worst country to be an artist um, and to live from it. Yeah. So do it like have a normal job <laughs> where you earn your money and do the rest <laughs> on the weekends and in the night. Yeah. So therefore, I think that's just one reason when it comes to recycling. I know many social projects, actually. Yeah but which already indicates that it's really hard to make your own living because it's all supported and funded that, that they do it in that. All the other people I know is really that the majority cannot, can't, they do it because it's their life and they are really, um, they are convinced and they want to leave it and that they don't stop, but they don't have a good time. It's really not, it's not easy. It's just really a few individuals um, and they n hardly ever do recycling they do any other kind of industrial design, they are in touch with uh, business people, they work for big companies, there is a few Austrian designers and they definitely, I mean they, they have their own company and they make their living, but the rest um, the rest of the people I know actually, yeah, for them it's it's just really, they leave their conviction but They don't. It's not easy. Uh, one of the questions in, in, for me in this moment is uh, how my work and the work of Madalena have in common. Uh, I think uh, could be a lot. Uh, our work is uh, uh, quite different, but I think that uh, I, I like the work of Madalena. But for me, the problem is the research of the beauty. 
for I am Italian. Uh, in Italian, for my work, it's important to, f to to search and find the beauty. And I think that when I see the the work of Maddalena, I can find some pieces very very beautiful. Some other no, but. I think that the, the design in this moment in, is to search the beauty. Um, if I have to speak for the Netherlands, I think the situation is, is uh, more or less the same as in Denmark. That we have a large uh, design tradition. Uh, but if I specify to this project um, uh, on sustainability, uh, the EcoFond, um, and how I got to this position that we actually only asked ourselves the question. I think in the Netherlands uh, there's great awareness about uh, the environment um, so that, that creates also a climate that people start looking for solutions not only in, in, in typefaces but also in buildings and uh, other um, environmental uh, projects. And actually that was quite surprising for us um, uh, when the EcoFond was downloaded in Brazil for example then they they, they um, emailed us uh, like okay it's it's really nice that it's good for the environment but it's also good for our wallet uh, because it saves us a lot of money uh, and that's our main goal to use it and actually that I thought uh, Magdalena said that as well like those people there um, they they are more concerned with the with the money aspect but. Um, then again, it doesn't matter why you use recycled uh, products or uh, products that um, uh, produce less waste. The reason is not, not really relevant because it both saves uh, uh, waste. So, I think it's a very valid point that Magdalena came with, that we had to um, uh, educate ourselves as managers uh, to sell our designs because uh, many, uh, many industries might have this... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, th three three pillar baseline. Basically, you got like a social uh, social uh, responsibility. You got environmental uh, responsibility, and you got the the economical responsibility. And I think that most of us can feel if we're working with it like a huge company, the the two first responsibilities that I mentioned are only there because the, the, the financial responsibility, uh, responsibilities are met, basically. So we, if we need to sell these uh, um, environmental and social uh, products and solutions through, we need to argue that uh, through a, uh, what you call a, um, a financial standpoint, basically. As you said, that they need to see that they save money in order to be socially responsible and environmental environmentally responsible so it's it's we've we've ran our heads to a wall uh, a couple of times uh, just like uh, expecting that some company companies could see but you're doing this for the good of the people you know doing this for the good of the environment and they'll go yeah 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 sure sure, sure. But how much is going to cost us you know? so Great. Buenas tardes. Muchas felicidades a todos. Son ustedes magníficos. Yo tendría una pregunta para Magdalena. ¿Cómo se las arreglan para llegar al mercado ustedes? ¿Y cómo llegan al mercado las personas a las que ustedes les enseñan? Por favor, tengo un interés inmenso en conocer esto. Gracias. We had that at breakfast. <laughs> No, I understand your question because it's it's really important. The thing is, um, we are at the market, but I wouldn't call it um, a real strategy because <laughs> theoretically, it um, this is done by myself. There is no other person in the whole project um, who is in any way interested or really uh, or helps me. Let's say to to. To, to get into the market. So what I do is, I mean, we have a website, which is not bad, but also not perfect. Um, we have now our own showroom where we have two or three events a year. Um, we collect addresses and try to get people uh, that they come to our place, um, which is hard work because it's not, um, it's not central um, and it's not a perfect venue. 
um, and the rest is done that we um, we have retailers in the city of Vienna, in the in the very center of the city, which we just simply did. I I I know the city. I know shops. I thought, okay, where would our product sell, or where would I like to see them? I went there um, and I asked. Yeah, some of them, some of the things worked out. Some did not. Um, I do a lot of research in the internet, also when it comes to to exhibitions and fair fairs. Um, whatever we can afford, let's say, or sometimes I do it in my in my spare time when I do a holiday. I, wherever I go, every city in Europe, <laughs> I do recycling research. What's going on? Is there any shops where I want to place our products? Is there any exhibition um, which would be interesting for us? And then I suggested uh, to the head of the project, um, along with how much the trip's going to cost, um, and if I, if I can go there, um, exhibit the product and sell, and hope that within these three or four days of exhibition, um, I get in touch with local people uh, who really like parts of our uh, of our products, for example, uh, and setting up a network. Uh, we had some real, uh, and the rest is very often you are just lucky. You meet uh, you meet people who are very. Um, initiative you know uh, who then help you you just stay in touch with them um yeah and that's how we now we sell in in england in london in manchester in barcelona um in finland in leipzig so germany we are actually now this is also for the year we started last year and this is for the the, the this is our goal for 2010 actually um that's what what we try to do step by step slowly and and maybe because you also were addressing the people in the project, whatever we do in Vienna, like uh, or quite close, I try to include the people that they come with me and they sell at the fair. I mean, I can't take everybody, yeah. But whenever I have the feeling there is somebody and they somehow they are able to, I try to take them along that they can get in touch with the consumer and that they can present their own work. And if it's not possible, I do a documentation, I do pictures, I, I sit down when I come back after such a journey, I tell them. I know exactly that one of the bowls was made by this person. I tell the person the story, who bought your the bowl you made, for example. Yeah. So I try to, uh, to somehow, or as good as possible, to, yeah, to, to connect them, at least mentally, and if possible, real, like also in reality. Alguna pregunta? Brian? Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, no es tanto una pregunta como también felicitaros, igual que los demás, por no tanto por vuestros premios que también, sino por la trayectoria que es evidente que, que traéis y el beneficio que, que generáis a, a la sociedad. En definitiva, eh, lo que os quiero transmitir es que dirijo un estudio de interiorismo aquí en Madrid y nosotros como máxima tenemos en el estudio nuestra filosofía de empresa y de vida que el diseño al fin y al cabo no es casi nada más y nada menos que algo que mejora la vida de las personas. En ese sentido, eh, felicito también a la EOI en la elección de los ponentes de esta mesa porque representáis tal vez los pilares que, que podrían representar un diseño casi perfecto, que es Magdalena, la, la producción en la cual ya no solo mejora la vida de las personas que reciben el producto o que luego lo van a utilizar, sino quien lo fabrica incluso quien participa del proceso productivo, Gabriele, en cuanto al, a algo muy importante que entendemos nosotros, que es la belleza de los objetos que creamos y de los espacios que diseñamos, porque al fin y al cabo eh, aportan emoción a la vivencia de las personas. Alexander, en cuanto a que pones en contacto a unas personas con otras a través del diseño, me parece muy importante también. Y Silas y Cliff, en cuanto a que aportáis eh, con el diseño una, una faceta, yo creo, muy importante de la cultura, de la sociedad, que muchas veces no se ve así, por lo menos no en todos los sitios. Así que no era tanto una pregunta como felicitaros por vuestro trabajo. Muchas gracias. Por ahí 
Está siendo interesante el... Hi, good afternoon. I will try in English. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank all of you because your speech was very interesting and very good. Um, I have a question from for Silas and Cliff. Um, in your personal opinion, how do you think internet and new social media um, has changed the way of of work? I mean, in creativity. Okay. Um, for example, you have show us some broadcast. I don't know if you made it specific for the client or if you just take it from youtube.com or other website. So I would like to know your opinion about that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I think I think the social media and and, and uh, well. The whole web thing is uh, basically just a great way of uh, getting um, uh, getting exposed to more ideas all of the time, basically. And of course, that we uh, at Saatchi and Saatchi were um, were influenced and inspired by that. Um, basically, uh, from from all from all the YouTube stuff, uh, that very banal stuff. Somebody falls over and it, and it, everybody laughs, basically. Um, so we we tapped into the feeling that it was homemade. Uh, that was what we used from the internet, and so that if we used sort of a language that that showed that it was homemade, it would it would um, it would spread easily, and it would be a language that the young people understood. But when that is said, the the stories, the if you could call them stories, but the ideas for the actual situations. Are stuff that we've uh, written or made up, but the uh, expression of it that it's handheld, that it looks like it's somebody who who could tape it, is definitely uh, a, a thing that we uh, we got inspired from the web. Also, to to um, to kind of like keep on talking here, uh, I would just have I just have to say that that to answer your question about how how it'll 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 be. Uh, how it, it has uh, progressed, uh, the, the web and the internet. I think, I mean, we we as as very uh, commercial users of our creativity, because we work in advertising, are of course always looking for for uh, for new ways of doing stuff. And actually, in a in a in a in an agency where where things have been uh, in a business where things have been very uh, uh, let's make a film three prints and a radio for quite some time. Uh, now now it kind of seems like the possibilities are endless right now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff opening up um, and a lot of and a lot of barriers are not that 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 uh, marked anymore. So it's 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 more of like a gray area, a gray zone, uh, which I really like because it, it, it makes everything connect even more. I don't know if that answered your I don't know either. <risa> ¿Alguna pregunta? ¿Alguna pregunta más? ¿Alguna reflexión? Bueno, eh, yo para cerrar, eh, como estamos en una escuela de negocios <risa> y vosotros estáis en programas pues para potenciar o la creación de empresas o la consolidación de empresas o la relación o la gestión de vuestras empresas... Yo les quería preguntar a todos que, cuál es la relación en sus empresas entre creatividad y negocio y cómo, cómo lo gestionan, cómo, cómo hacen que eh, el negocio funcione sin perder creatividad y que la creatividad no se vea ahogada por el negocio. Um, <clears throat> well, partly um, because, like, if you work for a client, there's always an aspect of um, the, the business side. Uh, so um, that's why we decided to uh, additionally um, reserve the time for our own pro projects that have no financial uh, uh, restraints or uh, client restraints. So in our company, we... Uh, we do both and of course in the projects with clients we try to um, uh, uh, to let the creativity not be constrained by uh, by money or budget or um, but 
there's always a balance in a, between those two. Uh, I think that I am a very, very lucky man because, uh, and I think all the people that are here, because we do probably uh, the work that we like. And uh, our work is uh, our life, I think. So we are lucky. Uh, I think that the business is important, but in the way that we can find a, a good way for uh, our life. So, uh, for me, the business is important in, in the um, relationship with uh, our customer. It's important to control the prices, to control the investments, to control all the things, because uh, creativity, I think, is not enough to do a good project. We have to control all the other things. And so, for us, it's important that we take money to invest, to reinvest in our work. I mean, we we have that issue a lot because theoretically, yeah, we could sell some of our products really at any price because we are because we are a funded project. So we dis we di we discuss that a lot. Let's say what is the what should the price also of what you sell? What should it be ba based on? And I think that it's really important. Um, also, when you consider like colleagues or any other initiative, yeah, that that you really. Um, it should still be like affordable that's also one aspect because also we want our people let's say to get some of the things if they like yeah uh, but on the other hand you should honor like in our case either craftsmanship or an idea yeah because it's always what i sometimes you hear something and they said oh th this is th the idea is great yeah, but how long did it take? <laughs> or how much work was it? And I guess maybe, or you you might know that from your own work, um, that there is still so many people in this world who have no clue how much hard work, creative work is. Like they think, I don't know, you have a vision at night and you wake up in the morning <laughs> and you just have the perfect concept or the perfect design idea or you just developed something. But it's, that's not how, how it is. And I think this um, should still be valued. And this is what um, some other people and also our clients have to learn in an acceptable way. In a big company like Sachin <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, well, I, I think that, I mean, of course we're like, we're struggling with problems like these basically every day, uh, working with, with huge clients like Coca-Cola who has like brand Bibles and stuff like that. Uh, the, the, the really nice thing about working on, on with, with the WWF and, and Parkinson's disease uh, foundation and stuff like that is that it it's pro bono work we we don't we don't get paid basically we do it because we think it's a good idea and that makes all the restrictions go away because we basically get 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 a get a like a free yeah. playing <laughs> space to roam around and so um, so actually that's that's uh, it's very much like Alexander talked about um, hmm. but but then again we uh, I touched upon it before because, like, um, this is this is uh, these solutions are, are, are maybe f um, two to five percent of our times. And uh, um, if you are in a design process or you are creative yourself, you you, you gotta. I mean, you put your you put you put an effort in it. You you put your heart and soul in it. Uh, and if you, if you see nine out of ten of your solutions being being hacked down, uh, of course, it starts to um, it starts to hurt somewhere. Um, so I think that we've been through a schooling that that we need to uh, protect the work a bit better, and that's back to the, the the fact that we talked about before that let's argue these ideas through uh, financial terms, tell people that they can actually make money out of them, rather than expecting them to see the great idea or to to see the the the, uh, the social. Um, social uh, consequences of this great idea and not just to expect that they, 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 they can understand that and just want to be to be good people and, and good for the environment but, but acknowledge the fact that we uh, especially 
I mean, you guys are also about, especially in the, in the commercial business, it's, it's about the money and, and, and the bottom line, uh, because um, uh, Silas, and Silas and I are, are creatives, um, and we can get ideas, and that's how we make our money. We can't even make a DVD run properly. Um, so, so, I mean, so we, we've definitely had to, to learn these things, definitely. But also, that's, that's kind of how you, you, you grow in there. I mean, of course, you get... Because you, you do this every day, Cliff and I have been doing this for seven years now. Um, I mean, of course, you get kind of shortcuts to ways of thinking creatively. Uh, but 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 actually, one of the, the high points of our career was, was the day we could actually sell stuff through to the client. Um, because, because all of a sudden, you go like, people don't have to like fall down in awe over these like excellent idea you think you've got yourself because i mean it might not be shared so with other people but um but if you have the practical arguments to sell it in if you can answer every question they come with there's a there's a there's a way better chance of them actually buying it so um, yeah. muy bien pues antes de acabar eh, la mesa redonda agradecer pues a los organizadores que han hecho este premio posible, que vuelvo a insistir lo que dije eh, al principio, que en estos momentos de crisis es, o, o para mí, estas iniciativas son una luz que alumbra hacia dónde hay que ir eh, en el nuevo modelo económico por el cual queremos apostar en España. Agradecer a los organizadores, a la central de diseño DIMAT, al Ayuntamiento de Madrid... A, el, a los sponsors, el IDAE, a la escuela, la EOI, la escuela eh, que, que no solo está acogiendo esta mesa redonda, sino que la, también ha sido sponsor de estos premios, a la Fundación Arte y Derecho, a la cooperación de ASA a la, y, el patro, y el apoyo de Philips, El País y Antalis. Larga vida a estos premios. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, that you are here and see you in the next time. Okay. Yeah.